Uh, I want you to take your Bibles and please turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, that's what we're going to be at tonight. Now, uh, I wanted to kind of just paint you a, a little bit of a picture. 17 million. What comes to your mind when you think of 17 million? Shout it out, go ahead. 17 million. Large number of people. A large number of people. Yeah. Wow. Okay, my mind didn't go there first, brother. Oh. It did get there. What else? 17 million my money. dollars. Okay, that's where my mind went when I heard 17 million. So I thought 17 million dollars. If I were to be, let's say, live to be 80 years old, that would be $369,565 each year for the rest of my life from now until I'm 80 years old. $369,000. 17 million miles. If we were to travel around the world, would be 682 revolutions around the globe. And 17 million souls, if we were to count the growing number of a false faith in the world, would be 17 million too many. And yet, this many are deceived. Now, I would like to read us a story. When Joseph left the grove after seeing the father and the son, he was not a prophet. He had no calling and no idea that he ever would have. The calling came three and a half years later. Joseph Journal tells the story. When I was about 17 years, it says, I had another vision of angels. In the ninth season, after I had retired to bed, I had not been asleep, but was meditating on my past life and experience. I was well aware I had not kept the commandments, and I repented heartily for all my sins and transgressions, and humbled myself before him, whose eye surveys all things at a glance. All at once the room was illuminated above the brightness of the sun. An angel appeared before me, Joseph said, and declared, I am a messenger sent from God. The angel said his name was Moroni, and that God had vital work for Joseph to do. When Joseph prayed that September evening, he had full confidence that he would obtain a divine manifestation. His, his certainty stemmed from his reassuring vision in the grove three and a half years earlier. Joseph wrote, I discovered a light appearing in my room, which continued to increase until the room was lighter than at noonday, when immediately a personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He had on a loose robe of the most exquisite whiteness. His hands were naked and his arms also, a little above the wrist, so also were his feet naked. As were his legs a little above his ankles, his head and his neck were bare, I could discover that he had no other clothing on but this robe, as it was open so that I could see into his bosom. Not only was his robe exceedingly white, but his whole person was glorious beyond description, and his countenance truly like lightning. The room was exceedingly light, but not so very bright as immediately around his person. When I first looked upon him, I was afraid, but the fear soon left me. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, and that his name was Moroni, that God had a work for me to do, and that my name should be both good and evil spoken of among all people. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, at the source from whence they sprang. He also said that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it, as delivered by the Savior to the ancient inhabitants. Does anybody know who said that? Who they're talking about? Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith would be the founder of a cult, we would call, and that uh, he was visited by this bright, angelic being in his bedroom, and he received these these golden plates, these golden plates that had these books written on it in which he was the only one able to uh, be a prophet, able to uh, transcribe it into English so that way we could have it. We would know that as the Book of Mormon. Now, 2 Corinthians, please stand with me. I know we're doing a lot of reading, but I will get there. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the first 15 verses, we'll go ahead and read and We'll read every other until we get to 15. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 1 through 15, an important portion of Scripture written thousands of years ago, so that way when something like 
an angel visiting you, you would know what it means. Mm -hmm. You would know what to be weary of. Okay. I'll start. Would to God you could bear with me a little in my folly and indeed bear with me altogether. For I am I'm jealous over you, over you with godly jealousy. For I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if he receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. For I suppose I was not a whit be behind the very chiefest apostles, but though I be rude in speech, yet not in knowledge, but we have been thoroughly made manifest among you in all things. Have I committed an offense in abasing myself that ye might be exalted because I have preached to you the gospel of God freely? I robbed other churches, taking wages of them to do you service. And when I was present with you and wanted, I was chargeable to no man for that which was lacking to me, the brethren which came from Macedonia supplied. And in all things, I have kept myself from being burdensome unto you. And so will I keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth, but what I do, that I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them which desire occasion, that wherein they glory, they may be found even as we. For such, we're, we're talking about these people who we're talking about, we just read about, for such false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And altogether on 15, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. They will be judged by their works. They are ministers of light. They almost even appear Christ-like in a way. They do good things, but they're going to be judged by their works because they don't know God. They don't, they don't trust in Him for salvation. They're, they're literally the very demons that are corrupting God, the gospel. Amen. Now, the title of tonight's message, The Articles of a False Faith. Let's pray. Dear Lord, please uh, allow us to get through this whole message tonight. Allow me to be clear. I for me to decrease, for you to increase, for your word, or to be magnified. And I just simply hope that we can rest our truth and our belief right there exactly in your word. Help us to do it. Give us your wisdom, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. All right. 17 million. 17 million Mormons worldwide. 17 million is a lot. Now, 3 million souls live in Utah. Utah, that would be their capital. Now, only about 75, I say only, 75% of those 3 million souls in Utah are Mormon. It's the second fastest growing church in America. Now, I was doing a job on Monday, I'm an electrician, and I walked into a house, a big, beautiful house, and as I walked in, I saw right there, right by the front door, a beautiful piano and this really big, beautiful King James Bible. Said, praise God. And so your eye goes to something like that, right? And then you kind of notice this other book that's right next to it. And then this other book that's right next to it. And so I, I, I got a little bit closer and it said the Book of Mormon, the King James Bible, and then another one that's called Doctrines and Covenants. And I said, okay, what is all this about? And so uh, what do you do? You know, as, as we are soul winners, we're not just soul winners on Saturday, but wherever we go, we sow. And so I, I was there to fix an electrical problem, but immediately I start talking. And I start saying, so, I, I see your Bible right there. Do you play the piano? And so we get into it. And so what do you do? You, you take them to the gospel. You ask them this question. What's the gospel? Oh, I was a missionary for 20 years over in Africa. I know what the gospel is. I know what the gospel is. Okay, what's the gospel? Well, you know, you got to uh, trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And then you have to do good works by him. 
and then uh, through that faith, you know, people are going to see that, and then they're going to want to repeat it. And then uh, you know, you take them to the Book of Mormon and you explain to them the necktie. And so I'm like, I said, okay, well, hold on. I said, where is that in the Bible? Where do we find this in the Bible? Oh, fast forward two hours later. Two hours later, they handed me this. The, the wife, she was kind of coming in and out. She would say things like, well, if I don't feel God, then he's not real. And so you can say whatever you want about the Bible, whatever that says. I don't care. I have to feel it for it to be real. And the husband was a little bit different. He, he took me to the Book of Mormon. He said, this is where I stand, you know, and so I'll, we'll get into that a little bit more. The wife came back at the end of our two-hour conversation. I didn't even get to the job till after that, which I still, you know, I did. I fixed their stuff. And they handed me this right here. And it says, right, they, they said, this is what we believe. They handed it to me. And she took me first to, to uh, verse 11, or, or article 11, and that's what we were talking about at the end of our conversation. But I started reading all of them. It says, the articles of faith of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Now, as I typed up my message, every time I referenced this or anything, I just really, I couldn't capitalize the J on that Jesus. I think this is another Jesus. I don't think this is the Jesus of the Bible. So, that's our point number one. The 13 articles written by Joseph Smith. Let's get into it. All right, the articles of their false faith. I'll read you the first article of what they believe. We believe in God, the eternal Father, and in his Son, Jesus Christ, and in the Holy Ghost. Praise God, I believe that too. All right, cool. Uh, now, even a blind squirrel finds a nut occasionally. A broken clock is even right twice a day. Now, you're already there in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look back at verse 4 with me, and let's read it. For if he that cometh preacheth, un preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit which ye have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. They're coming and preaching. Uh, this, is, this is kind of behind the scenes right here. I'm just letting you know. They're preaching another gospel. They're yeah. preaching another gospel. They're preaching another gospel. That's why I do not agree with their first point saying, we believe in God, the eternal Father, His Son, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. You know, There is no common ground with us simply because their Jesus, their God that they're praying to is not the same as ours. Yeah. And I'll explain to you a couple more points why that's true. Now, the, the second thing. The second thing, we believe, this is what they believe, not me. We believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. Okay? Uh, I've never heard it explained that way. Why would, why would we have to pay for Adam's sin? But, okay, I, I agree that we do have to pay for our own sins. You know, uh, Romans chapter 3, verses 10 and verses 23 tell us that um, we're all sinners. You know, there is none good. No, no. We, we know, we understand that we're sinners. Yes, and we're going to have to pay for our sins. Well, why, do they, why do they say it like this? Okay, we'll come to find out. The Mormons believe in something called the pre-existence. Yeah. The pre-existence. And so it's funny, I didn't understand what this lady was trying to say to me when we were talking. And she said, well, well what do you believe about before you were born? Where were you? And I said, I wasn't existing. I didn't exist. And she said, oh, well, that's not what I believe. And she went into how there is uh, the Father in heaven, and then there are spiritual mothers in heaven, and they consummate and create spiritual babies. God the Father takes those spiritual babies and puts them into babies on earth, and then they are tested. And if they are found to be true or righteous or right according to their gospel, then they can go to heaven. Okay. That's what they believe. And so this, this two, uh, this point two, we believe that men will be punished for their own sins and not for Adam's transgression. They don't believe in original sin. They don't believe that we're born with a sin nature. Okay. They believe that we are pre-existent. The soul exists in heaven with the Father before, and he sends us down. We are completely different in that. And so I asked that lady, I said, where do you get that from? And she said, I get it from the Bible. I said, where? Couldn't take me anywhere. Yeah. Couldn't take me anywhere in the Bible. All right. That's what they believe. Oh, we believe that life is given at conception. Yeah. We believe that sin nature is adopted by us because of our federal head, Adam, the first man who sinned. Okay. Sin nature is passed upon all of us. Now, this is the third thing that they believe. They say, we believe that through the atonement of Christ, all mankind may be saved. Okay, that sounds good. I, I'm, I'm with you. By obedience to the laws and ordinances of the gospel. Uh, 
man, you are close. Uh, but no, we do not. We have, we have a problem. We, we have a big problem right there. We don't believe that. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, we know it. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Oh, I, I made it to heaven. I did all these wonderful things. I obeyed the laws and the ordinances of the gospel. That's not what the Bible says. That is not what the Bible says about how we go to heaven. We don't go because we're good. We don't go because we deserve it. We don't go because we've earned it. We don't go because we've followed anything. We go because it is finished, and through his blood we have been washed clean. And when God looks at us, he sees Jesus Christ's righteousness. Amen. We don't deserve it. We don't Amen. deserve it. Salvation is a free gift. Galatians chapter 2 and, and verse 16. This is the number one verse that I like to go to when I'm talking to a Mormon. Look at this one. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ. Amen. Even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. No flesh. I mean, no is pretty well encompassing, right? And that means everything. That means Amen. every single human in the world. You ask him, what, what laws and what ordinances are you talking about? When Jesus died on the cross, the last thing he said in the book of John, it is finished. Amen. And that is sufficient for me. When I asked them if they knew they were going to heaven, do you know that you know that you know they're going, oh yeah, oh we're going to heaven. How? Well, because Jesus Christ died for sins, praise God, and that we are, we are, we're doing the things, we are living a righteous and a holy and a perfect, a perfect and a complete life. Ooh. That is not the gospel message. If it has anything to do with you, anything to do with you, you're going to mess it up. Yeah. It has 0% to do with you and 100% to do with Jesus Christ. And we put all of our faith, all of our hope, all of our belief, all of our trust on Jesus Christ yeah. and 0% on me because we're going to mess it up. Yeah. Now, their fourth article. We believe that the first principles and ordinances of the gospel are, first, faith in the Lord, okay? Faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Second, repentance. Third, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Fourth, laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they just said that there are laws and ordinances to salvation, and here they are. You have to have these four things in order to be saved. These are the things that you have to do in order to be saved. What was number one? Faith in Jesus. Yes. And I wish it stopped there, because that's what the Bible says. Yeah. I wish it did, but it did. Repentance. Now, congregation... You know that you do not have to repent. You don't have to feel very, very sorry for sins. You don't have to even be willing to turn away from your sins because repentance as they define it and as most denominations in the world define it today is wrong. Yeah. If repentance was turning away from sin, if repentance was feeling really, really sorry for something, then why is it that the person who repents the most in the Bible is God? Amen. How would that be possible? How could God be sorry for sin? How? Jonah 3.10 is the classic example of Genesis chapter 6, the first time that we ever see it. Repentance has nothing to do with salvation. Amen. Now, when they say that, that they say, uh, be baptized for the remission of sin, you're getting that out of Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Yes, it's in the Bible. But what's your definition of that? What's your definition of repentance? The repented mind is the changing of your mind. That's why it says in Jonah 3.10 that God repented that he would uh, do evil unto Nineveh. He repented. He changed his mind. He was going to destroy Nineveh. They had a great revival where Jonah came. We learned this morning that he preached that to them, and they all got in sackcloth and ashes. And there was a, in the 600,000 people in that city, they all, even the animals, <laughs> repented. You know, they changed their minds. And then, and then what happened is the Lord said, well, now I changed my mind from destroying you to I'm no longer going to change. And then it's, it's the exact same thing. With Jesus and with John, they preached the same exact gospel. It wasn't different. The repentant mind is saying, I change my mind from trusting in works, and I change it into faith only in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's the repentance. It's not this sorrowful feeling thing. That's a doctrine that has creeped into the Bible that is not there. It is Amen. not there. That is a tradition of men. Amen. Now, that's repentance. Matthew chapter 21, 29. He answered, he answered and said, I will not, but afterward he repented. And went. Who, who, who repented? Who repented right there? He answered and said, I will not. This is Matthew 21, 29. They, they, they're asking Jesus, are you going to come up to the feast? Are you going to come up to Jerusalem? And he says, I will not. But afterward, he repented, and then he went. He changed his mind. Jesus repented. 
It, it's a biblical term. But what is the definition of repentance? It's very important that we get that right. God cannot turn from sin. God cannot feel so sorry for something that he has done. Mm. Now, by, baptism by immersion for the remission of sins. Ah, I disagree with this point. Baptism has, will, or never could wash away any sins. It's simply a work after salvation. It's just simply saying uh, that we're buried in the likeness and we're raised again and, and as he was resurrected. It's not, it has nothing to do with your salvation. Salvation is 100% Jesus Christ in his, when he shed his blood on the cross, that is it. That is paid for sins and we're done. All we have to do is trust in that. There is nothing else to it. They, they say, well, it's faith, it's repentance, it's baptism. And then, uh, you know, what is the last part right here? The last part that they say is laying on of hands. What? Okay, laying on of hands. Is it biblical? Yes, it's in the Bible. But what are they taking that for? Why are they saying that there's some laying on of hands? And I, and I think this is really important. It, people will, especially men, uh, in, in, a, in an, an agency, right? They're, they're all together in this congregation, and they say, well, you know, if you really want to be saved and you really want to be um, part of the group, you know, let me lay my hands on you, brother, and let me pray for you. And then you will receive the Holy Ghost. Like as if, <laughs> as if some man had anything to do with the, the controlling of how the Holy Ghost is administered. As if some man could step in between me and God. It's so absolutely ridiculous. But that's exactly what a cult's going to do. Yeah. They're going to get in between you. And they're going to say, you can't go to God. You have to go through me. Yeah. We see it with the Catholics. We see it with the Episcopalians. The Orthodox do it. And especially right here with the LDS Church, the Mormons. It's the exact same thing. Laying on hands. They think that they're... How ignorant, how ignorant of what the scripture says and how prideful of a man to be that way. Amen. Now, okay. Um, oh, let's see. Where are we at? Verse, are we on Article 5? Oh, yeah. We believe, this is what they believe. We believe that a man must be called of God by prophecy and by the laying on of hands by those who are in authority to preach the gospel and administer in the ordinances thereof. Man, they are really twisting that up. Uh, there is, let, how about this? How can you be called of God if you are not saved? Do they have the right salvation? No. Can you be called of God, therefore? No. So you're, you're two-step. The, the cart is before the horse or vice versa, however that good saying goes. It's, it's just wrong. If you don't have that Holy Ghost indwelling, now they might hear a, a calling. They might feel a tug of carnality inside of their flesh. They might even see an open door, something like that, but it's not God leading these people. It's another spirit. Amen. Now, Acts chapter 8, verse 18, I'll just read it for you. Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as uh, yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands on the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, this is Simon saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. That sums up pretty well. Yeah. They believe that they, they have these, this power to uh, indwell this Holy Ghost. No. And just as Simon thought he could have it too, he couldn't because he didn't even have a right heart with God. He wasn't even saved. He was in it for all the wrong intentions. Now, six. Six. This is this. And remember, there are 13, so we're right about at halfway. This is what they believe. Article six. We believe in the same organization that existed in the primitive church, namely apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, evangelists, and so forth. The primitive church. Every single denomination, every single cult, every single person that wants to be a Christian or associated with God is going to say this exact same thing. We can trace our lineage all the way back, all the way to the very apostles of Jesus Christ. Every single denomination says that. Every single one. They're, they, they call themselves the apostolic church. Okay? Well, you can make that claim, but that doesn't make it true. Amen. That does not make it true. Every organization says that. Every denomination. Every church claims that. Now, we are the apostolic heirs who have carried that tradition of the apostles from Jesus all the way down to today. Every single cult says the exact same thing. Let's, let's be fair. Even the Reformed Baptists would say something like that. And even us. The difference is our claim. Is that we trace back not as a Baptist. 
we don't trace our heritage back to Baptists. Because Baptists only goes back so far. You got the Anabaptists, you can say, well, John the Baptist, yeah. His followers were called Baptists, though. We trace our heritage back through the Bible. Amen. That's why we call ourselves Bible believers. It's our final uh, point of all, all, all of our faith and all of our practice. It's our final authority. And that's how we trace our lineage. Not with this denomination, not with that denomination, not with this family name, not with this heritage, not with this pedigree, not with this ethnicity. We trace it back to the Bible. Amen. We're Bible believers. And you can trace Bible believers all the way back to, well, the beginning. All the way. All the way back. You can take the, the chain of the Bible and Bible believers and you can shake it and it will go all the way back to the beginning. Amen. Ooh. Now, seven. I gotta move a little bit. Seven. We believe, this is what they believe. I don't believe this. We believe in the gift of tongues, prophecy, revelation, visions, healing, interpretation of tongues, and so forth. Well, that's very vague in general. All right, uh, seven. How about this? What kind of tongues are we talking about? Are we talking about biblical tongues? Are we talking about prophetic tongues? Are we talking about tongues as in languages? Are we talking about tongues as in vain babblings, just things that people are throwing out there that sound kind of uh, foolish and ridiculous? Well, what kind of tongues are we talking about? I believe that, actually, I just found this in a book. I'm going to read it for you. Tongues. But what was the meaning of Pentecost? And, and anybody who believes charismatic tongues, hyper-charismatic tongues, as in these, these words that are given from the angels for us to speak, what was the meaning of Pentecost? They'll take you to Pentecost. They'll take you to Acts chapter 2, and they'll say, see? Okay. It was the power to win souls. Now, listen to this. This is... This is the one great essential Bible passage that deals with speaking in tongues at Pentecost. Here they spoke in tongues. What does that mean? Every man heard them speak in his own language. We are talking about literal languages, but given miraculously in a time of need. Here is the principal Bible passage on talking in tongues. This is the great example in the Bible, and we must have in mind what God had in mind and learn what the Bible really says not what some man implies. Yeah. Absolutely right. Prophecy, well, if the prophecy is coming from the Bible, something that's already been laid out for us, then yeah, absolutely. Revelation, they say, revelation, same exact thing. That revelation better come from the Bible. If it comes from any other source, absolutely not. No, yeah. no, no. Visions? I don't believe visions. I don't believe that people are seeing these things and that it's coming from God and that, uh, I mean, how do, how do we determine something like that? It's just... It's, it's not solid ground. It's shifting sand. Healing, maybe I've heard of some things uh, from men I would respect have said things that, that I wouldn't be able to explain. God is supernatural, absolutely. He raised himself from the dead. Uh, but do I understand it? No, and I am very skeptical about that. Interpretation, yes, of course. We need someone who speaks that language to interpret the language, the tongue. Now, eight, this is what they say. This is a, this one right here. We believe the Bible to be the word of God as far as it is translated correctly. We also believe the Book of Mormon to be the Word of God. Did you catch that? We also believe that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God. And so what do I ask them, the, the, the couple that I, that I was witnessing to the other day? Uh, you know, I said, is that Bible perfect, inerrant Word of God? They said, no. I said, is that book, the Book of Mormon, perfect, inerrant Word of God? You know what they said? They said, yes. They said, yes. They said, I, I said, why? And they said, well, that Bible was translated by a bunch of different men, and throughout the ages, things were changed. The same exact, uh, you know, parroted answer that you're always going to get. But Joseph Smith in 1830, he received this uh, from this angel, and he was allowed to translate these golden plates that were buried in the, in, in, on this hill. It's <laughs> so they, they, they really failed to realize that that faith is the same faith. It's the same faith. They just place their faith in the wrong thing. Right. And that's so sad that that's the work of the devil. He deceives. Yeah. Almost right, but still wrong. Half the truth is still a whole lot. Is the King James Bible perfect? They said no. Is the Book of Mormon perfect? More perfect than the King James. That's what they say. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, 
which is in Jesus Christ. Amen. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Amen. 2 Timothy 3.16. Praise God for it. And that's what we believe. We believe that the King James Bible is inerrant. It's without error. It's perfect. It's from God. And if God has the power to make the entire universe run, and if God can save, so if God can do so many things, why can't he just keep his word perfect and preserved? Why not? That's what the Bible says. It, it testifies of itself. Amen. And I believe that. Now, this is what they believe. Article 9. We believe, uh, we believe all that God has revealed, all that he does now reveal, and we believe that he will yet reveal many great and important things pertaining to the kingdom of God. Hmm. Now, this, this is called fresh revelations. Revelation, it's a, it's a wide-open door for Satan. It's a, it's a wide-open door for men who are greedy after filthy lucre or fame or fortune. And as a board of directors, uh, uh, men who put these things together, they have an agenda. They have an agenda. And so you look at that, it's kind of like a catch-all right there. And they're saying, well, this could have been that, and this could have been this. And then in the future, this could be something else that comes from God. Just like when the Pope speaks ex cathedra, it's like as if he is speaking as God himself. They're just saying, well, then now they've given themselves an open door to be whatever it want, they want it to be. Now, Revelation chapter 22 has something else to say. The very end of our Bibles. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. That's what I'm interested in, the prophecy of this book. I'm not interested in the prophecy of a man. I'm not interested in the prophecy of the Book of Mormon. I'm not interested in the prophecy of the covenants uh, of Joseph Smith. I don't care. I want to know about this book. If any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. And what do we see that Joseph Smith and what do we see that these 17 million souls have done? They have believed in an addition to this prophecy. And they have said, anything else that comes from, from this movement right here, we're going to believe it. And Christ said right here in, in Revelation 22, believe not. If you do, these plagues are going to be added unto you. I feel like that, that is a, a terrible thing. It's a fearful thing to be uh, in the hands of an of a angry God, or in the hands of God. Now, 10. This is the 10th article. We're almost done. You guys are doing great. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes, that Zion, they call the New Jerusalem, will be built upon the American continent, that Christ will reign personally upon the earth, and that the earth will be renewed and receive its paradisical glory. It will receive, it'll go back to the garden. It'll go back to the garden. They're not the only uh, cult that believes this. There's other ones too. Now, we know what the Bible says. Revelation 21, just a chapter before what we just read, and I saw a new heaven. And a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, come down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. That's what we believe. Amen. This earth is going to pass away. Even this heaven is going to pass away. And God is going to give us a new one. That's what we believe. Why? That's what the Bible says. Now, this is their 11th article. We claim, they claim, the privilege of worshiping Almighty God according to the dictates of our own conscience. And allow all men to the same privilege. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. This is from Joseph Smith in the 1800s. This is from Joseph Smith in the 1800s. And this is what really got them to print this out and hand it to me. Because I was saying that, well, the Bible says something different about how we should worship God. The Bible says something different. You know, what are we to do? Should we, should we worship God as our conscience dictates, or should we worship God as he dictates in the Bible? What do you believe? Well, I believe what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. We do it in his name. We don't do it in our own name. We do it because this is the way he has ordained it. This is the way that he wants it done. If, if my son started say, uh, trying to please me by doing something his way, and he thinks, well, he wants me to mow the grass, so he goes and he mows grass, but he only mows half of it because that's what to him is mowing the grass, 
That's not right. I'm not going to be pleased with that because I have dictated, because I have told him, because my expectation is what I have said. And what I have said is mow all the grass, but you've only done half. You've done it wrong. That is not pleasing. He mows the grass perfect every time. That's not what I'm saying. Right? But now, that's what they say. That's their 11th. The 12th. The 12th article. We believe in being subject to kings, presidents, rulers, magistrates, in obeying, honoring, and sustaining the law. Oof. Where do you get that from? Does that come from the Bible? Where do you pull that from? A lot of people will use that. The cops will use that and say, oh, the Bible tells us that we, you, you're, you're a Christian. You're supposed, to, um, you're supposed to follow your authorities, right? You're supposed to follow your – and I'm, I'm an appointed authority, and that can go all throughout. But what does the Bible say about that authority? What does the Bible say? Okay, Hebrews chapter 13. That's where they get it from, and I'll read it for us. Remember them which have the rule over you. That's what they'll use. But it goes on. That's not the whole verse. Who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversations. Jesus Christ the same yesterday and today and forever. Remember them which have the rule over you. They're talking about your pastors, talking about your shepherd, talking about your overseer, talking about your bishop, talking about your Sunday school teacher, talking about somebody who is spiritually sharpening you. No. It says, remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. That person who takes the Bible and tries to help you with it. Uh, whose faith follow. They have a faith that you can follow. And then considering the end of their conversation, that word conversation is the end of their conduct. Watching their conduct. And you're knowing that their conduct is something that I can follow. That's who the Bible says that we are to follow. It's not talking about magistrates. It's not talking about kings. It's not talking about presidents. It's not talking about rulers. It's not talking about obeying all these other people to sustain the law. No, it's talking about the people who are looking after your soul. Right. Follow them. I don't agree with that 12th article they have. Now, here's the 13th. Here's the 13th. We believe in being honest, true, chaste, benevolent, virtuous, and in doing good to all men. Indeed, we may say that we follow the admonition of Paul. We believe all things. We hope all things. We have endured many things and hope to be able to endure all things. If there is anything virtuous, lovely, or of good report or praiseworthy, we seek after these things. And so they said this to, they, they said this to me. They said, you know, Joseph Smith... Why are we still talking about him today? Why is it that people still hate him? Why is it that, the, that when you go online, there are literally thousands of websites that, that are making fun of or, or hating the Mormons? You know, and they'll take that and they'll say that the church is true and what Joseph Smith has said is true because of the persecution in which they are receiving today. Every cult says the same thing. Right. They say, well... We're getting persecuted because the Bible says that we're to be persecuted. That, that angel that Moroni said, you're going to be persecuted, told Joseph Smith, you're going to be persecuted for this. Everybody says that. Of course they're going to be persecuted. Why? Because the Bible says something different than what he is saying. That's the very reason. It, and and when, you, when they write something uh, out of, this is out of what, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter, where he's talking about, we believe all things, we hope all things. We have endured many things. Oh, there's all, this, all these terrible things that have happened to us. They're taking this out of context. What is the context of Paul writing in 1 Corinthians and saying this? They're saying, oh, we're just following the Bible. You don't even believe the Bible. Right. You don't even believe that it's true. Amen. And yet here it is. You're quoting it. Oh, it's so backwards and ridiculous. It sounds nice, but when you actually peel back that layer and you go a little bit more than skin deep, it's a whole different thing. Now, my conclusion to the conversation that I had with them, I kept going back to the Bible. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? And if what they were saying didn't match up with the Bible, then I said, I simply don't believe that because it's not in the Bible. And they would say, oh, well, you know, I feel this, or the Book of Mormon says that, or Joseph Smith said this. And, well, that's fine, but we know that we are to stick to this. We are to stick to the word of God. There's a warning against uh, if we don't. The, the terrible things that could happen. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. I mean, they're going to look just like they are. They're, they're going to be wearing suits. They're going to look like they're uh, put together. You know, they have a nice house. It, it seems like God is blessing them. But man, the Bible tells us they're going to be transformed like the apostles of Christ. And no marvel... For Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, 
whose end shall be according to their works. Our end, Christian, our end, if you're saved, our end, we're going to be judged by our faith. Amen. If you're saved, you're judged by your faith. Amen. Now, if you're not saved, you'll be judged by your works. That's what this is talking about. That's what the Bible says. Do you want to be judged by your faith in Christ, or do you want to be judged by your works? And the Bible tells us that all of your works are but filthy rags. Amen. Amen. He doesn't care how good you are. All he cares about is that you trusted in my son Amen. and my sacrifice for him. You can do whatever you want. It's going to count for nothing. You will be judged according to your works unless I see the blood. Amen. Unless I see that blood of Jesus Christ. Now, here's a question I asked them that kind of stumped them that makes no sense. If you mean a Mormon, I'll give you two things. Ask them this. Where was the church before Joseph Smith? I mean, if he came around in 1820, he came around and that's when he found these tablets when he was 14. He was used by this uh, angel to, to you know, transcribe them and give, put them in English. Well, then where was God's word all before that? Where? Could nobody get saved from 70 AD after the fall of Jerusalem all the way to the 1800s? Like, what happened to all of those souls? Because the Bible tells us that God wants all men to be saved and come unto the knowledge of repentance, right? So what happened to all those souls? That doesn't seem right. You know, it's the same exact argument that we could make with the Dead Sea Scrolls. If that is the critical text, and if that is correct, then why would God allow the, that to be hidden for 1,800 years? Right. It doesn't make any sense. God would not hide his word. Now, that's fine. You can ask them that question. Now, we could also take them to John 3, John 3.3, uh, 3, John 3.16, John 3.36. But remember this. Remember this, number one, whenever you're talking to the church of the Latter-day uh, Saints, whenever you're engaging them, just simply ask them this. Just simply ask them this. How are you saved? And what does the Bible say? What does the Bible say? We know that they believe in a works-based salvation. Amen. We know that. So we have to now help them to understand what the Bible says. The unfortunate part is that Satan has come in and said that the Bible is corrupt, and the Book of Mormon, which actually preaches another gospel, yeah. is true. Now, they're, they're, they're deceived, and that's terrible. Now, we can't do too much about it except preach the right gospel to them, but I can preach the right gospel. Have you heard the biblical gospel? You know what that means, the biblical gospel. You know? we're, we're all sinners. Every single person from, from Adam, that sin nature has now passed upon all men, but there was, uh, and there's a price for that sin. That, that price is that we will be judged according to our works if we die, and we're going to be according to our works, then we have to... Uh, pay for it in a place called hell, but just as equally as there is this place called hell, there's also equally this place called heaven, and that's where the Lord is at, and that's where he wants all men to come to, but there has to be a way to get there. Now, if we die and we're judged according to our works, we pay for it in hell, but there's Jesus Christ, and so one of my favorite verses, we got some time, Let, let's go to Romans chapter 6, oh, this is too good to pass over. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 23. Three things that I would show somebody. Three things that I like to show everybody when, I, when I'm giving them the gospel. Now, Romans chapter 6 and in verse 23, for the wages of sin is death. Now we know that the wage is what we get paid. Just like if you have a job, you get paid a wage for what you do. Now it's followed on with that, the wages of sin, which we know we're all sinners. The Bible says, um, for there are none righteous all know that we're sinners, so what we get paid, our wage, for sin, which is what we all are, is death. Does death sound like eternal life to you? Yeah. Absolutely. Death. We don't want death. Death and hell are cast into the lake of fire in Revelation chapter 20. They call it the second death. The second death. And we don't want that. The death of the body and then the death of the soul. Not annihilation. Not annihilation because your soul is eternal. Yeah. Now, but the gift of God, it goes on, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Three very important things. Number one, that it's a gift. The gift of God means that it has been paid for by someone else and given to you free. When you come down the stairs on Christmas and you see those presents under the tree, you know, you, you, you get those gifts because somebody else paid for those. When we go out and we hand things to people as a gift, I'm going to give you a gift after this. You didn't do anything to earn that. All you have to do is receive it. It's a gift paid for by somebody else. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, he paid for salvation. Amen. It's now a gift. He, he literally has it. 
He's paid for it with his own blood. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And he, now he holds it out unto every single man. He wants all men to be saved. And he's, he's paid for it with his own blood. He said, this is a gift. I paid for it. There's nothing that you can do to receive it except to take it in faith. Because if you do anything to earn this, it is no longer a gift. It is now a transaction. If I say, follow the Ten Commandments, and you may receive this gift. Well, now it's a transaction. It is no longer a gift, as the Bible clearly states right here. But the gift of God, it's God's gift because he paid for it with his own blood. But the gift of God is eternal life. When he, when he has this, he says, this is eternal, and I'm going to give it to you. If you receive that gift, you're going to expect to have it forever. Because if he ever took it away from you after the fact that you've received it, well, it was never eternal in the first place. That gift was temporal. You only had it for a time. He says, this gift is eternal. I've paid for it. You'll have it forever. Now, the third thing, it's through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. For there is no other name under heaven given whereby we may be saved. And that includes Chris. That includes Muhammad. That includes any name that you put in there except one. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who shed his blood. Because Jesus Christ is the only one who paid for the gift. And now he's the only one who can give it freely. Because he is the one who paid for it. He is the only one. There's no other name under heaven. We can't do anything. And we know uh, Ephesians chapter 2 that we're, we're saved by grace. God is graceful to us. Not necessarily that we deserve this gift. We don't deserve it, right? Amen. But it's through our faith that we're able to receive it. God is better to us than we deserve. And through our faith we're able to receive the gift. And that not of works thus any man should boast, not of anything that we can do. And it's simply summed up in this. Romans chapter 10 and verse 13 says,